I'm Debbie Friedman, and I'm a consultant for Friends of the Earth. I'll be your MC today throughout our session. And so this is a, you'll see a snapshot of our webinar series. This is the fourth and final in the series. And you'll see in the chat links to the first three webinars. I'd really encourage you to watch those webinars if you haven't yet. A lot of great resources there, a lot of information. Um, the webinars lift up the stories of innovative nutrition directors working hard on the ground and share strategies for success. They are our true heroes. And our team's also offering technical support for those of you who are working hard on the ground to provide our children with fresh nourishing meals. So please reach out to us if we can be of assistance to you. Again, you'll hear more about this during our webinar today and check out the uh, links in the chat for more information. We'd love to get a lot of participation today and we'll be asking you questions both verbally and in the chat. So please answer our questions, please participate. We definitely don't wanna have any Zoom zombies today. And we have a team of people here who will be answering your questions. So no question will go unanswered, unanswered. We also will have a lively panel of experts towards the end of the webinar or during the second half. And during that panel, we'll be able to answer your questions live. So uh, please let us know what you wanna know. And we're going to be launching three polls today. We'd love to get your uh, responses in to those polls. So um, let's hear from you. Okay, for a brief introduction to Friends of the Earth. Friends of the Earth is an environmental and social justice organization working on multiple environmental campaigns, including a climate-friendly food program. And so you're seeing here on the, on the screen some resources that highlights what's, highlights what's possible and also what's working in other school districts. And again, you'll see that uh, in the chat, links to these resources. I hope you'll take a look if you haven't already. And before we hear from our speakers, I'm going to briefly review what is climate-friendly cuisine. So in a nutshell, climate-friendly cuisine means food that uses less and better meat. And so more plant-forward options. And that means that meat is a condiment. It's not the main event. And also more plant-based options. And that means things like lentil burgers. It also means food produced using sustainable production practices. And that includes organic and pastured meat and dairy. And we don't want to forget packaging, food and packaging waste. Now we know this is really challenging during COVID, but we are seeing a lot of solutions. And so um, we're gonna share with you some photos of things happening on the ground. This is from Ojai Unified on the left, preparing cabbage. Photos on the middle and on the right is Encinitas Union. Um, the middle is better bolognese pasta, uh, and that's sorry, a better meat option. And the meat is from Marin Sun Farms and that's pasture-based land management, um, which fosters ecosystem resiliency. And that's you know, part of what we mean by better meat. And you'll hear more about that today. The last photo on the right are paper bags with organic produce, and those are for our distance learners. So thanks for sharing those photos. We're so impressed with all that's happening on the ground already. I'd like to introduce our topic today. So the speakers you're going to be hearing from are the Friends of the Earth team, Kari Hammerschlag, Emma Finn, Chloe Waterman. We also have, though behind the scenes today, our master of tech support, Bianca Gala. So Kari, Emma, and Chloe are gonna be sharing a really exciting preview of this soon to be released California State of School Menus report. Kari is going to explain first why they chose this area of focus. Emma will explain their findings and Chloe is going to share policy implica implications and also some policy recommendations and most importantly, how you can get involved because we really want to um, have your voices uh, lifted up to let our elected officials know what you think and what you need. So why engage with policy in the first place? Well, that's a, a passion of mine because policy is really resources and money. And policy advocacy is how we're going to influence our elected officials to let them know how those resources and our public dollars should be spent and so Friends of the Earth is working with partners in Sacramento and DC to elevate the voices of nutrition directors, to harness more resources and deploy them towards the solutions that you really need. So I am honored to pass this over to Kari, Deputy Director of Friends of the Earth's Food and Ag Program and co-author of this really uh, groundbreaking new report. Kari, you wanna take it from here? Great. Well, thank you so much, Debbie, and um, really appreciate you all being here. Really excited to share some of this research with you. So first, I'm going to provide broader context for this research, 
give you an overview of what we did and why we did it. So I don't need to tell you that school meals have a profound impact on the health and educational outcomes for students across the state. In California, school districts spend more than $1.5 billion a year to provide 540 million school lunches to over 4 million students, most of whom are low income and students of color. And how these dollars are spent and the quality of meals also has a big impact on the health of our planet. So on the health side, the majority of students who are eligible for free and reduced meals rely on school meals for up to half of their daily nutrition. And these students are at higher risk for diabetes and obesity. For example, in California, 20% of Black and Latinx adolescents have obesity, a rate three times higher than their white classmates. We see school meals as a critical intervention to address racial health disparities among children, especially those who lack access to healthy food at home. Now on the environmental side, as you have all heard in previous sessions, food has a huge impact on our environment. Resource intensive meat production in particular plays a major role in driving climate change and other environmental problems. So to give you an example of how this translates, when looking at the carbon footprint of your school food operations, the animal products, including cheese, typically will account for about 70 to 75% of the carbon footprint of your food purchases. And many leading scientific studies have found that in order for us to reach our climate goals, that we need to all, we need to reduce production and consumption of industrial animal products and change how we grow that food. And so what they're essentially saying is that we need to produce and serve less and better meat and more sustainably produced food overall. And that includes organic. So now we can't expect school lunch to solve all the world's problems, but we do believe that public funds should be harnessed for the public good. And that includes meeting public health and environmental goals. And by law, as many of you know, the meal patterns are supposed to be guided by the US dietary guidelines, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute. So on to our research. So what did we do? To better understand the opportunities for improving the environmental and health profile of California school meals, we did a deep dive into California school lunch menus and USDA foods purchasing. First, we analyzed over 1300 lunch entrees, Emma did a lot of that, um, served at the 25 largest public school districts in California during October of 2019 to identify the top menu items and the relative frequency of meat and dairy centric versus plant-based lunch entrees. We also examined California's bulk food spending through the USDA Foods Program and identified the companies that benefit most from this taxpayer funded program. Companies like Tyson, which is producing 100% industrial factory farmed meat and poultry, meaning massive polluting inhumane factory like conditions for animals that have huge negative health and environmental impacts that we discuss more in the report. So we focused on the USDA foods program because it is a major subsidy to school districts. And we know that, that it largely determines what ends up on the menu. So third, we calculated the carbon footprints of the top lunch entrees and estimated the greenhouse gas emissions associated with California USDA foods purchasing. And finally, and most importantly, we identified policy recommendations for how we can better align school food menus with public health recommendations and California's climate and sustainable food procurement goals. So we specially focused on the amount of plant-based food relative to meat centric dishes, because as you will see in this slide, virtually every public health organization urges greater consumption of plant-based foods and lower red and processed meat consumption for better health outcomes. And the US dietary guidelines also reference the importance of eating more plant-based foods. Um, the 2015 guidelines specifically recommend teenage boys eat less meat and that all children eat more plant-based proteins. And the most recent 2020 guidelines that are supposed to guide school lunches point out that three quarters of Americans exceed recommendations for meat and poultry, but don't get enough nuts, seeds, and soy products. And they also encourage fresh rather than processed meats. And they encourage shifting protein foods overall by replacing high fat and processed meat 
with fish or beans, peas, and lentils, a new food group um, in the 2020 gu guidelines. So Emma is going to go into greater detail about what we learned, but as a preview, I will I will say that that while we know that the school lunch program has been crucial to fighting food insecurity and we know meal quality has improved in recent years, our research did find a significant misalignment with leading public health organizations um, recommendations around less meat and more plants as well as with our state's climate goals. And as I say that, I just wanna emphasize that this analysis is not intended in any way to critique individuals or school districts. We know many of you are doing everything you can to satisfy kids' picky eating habits within tight budgets, strict regulations, challenging staffing situations and inadequate kitchen facilities. And we know that despite these challenges, schools have made remarkable progress towards serving healthier plant-based and organic food. And of course, much of this progress is highlighted in our reports that you can find in the chat and in, in previous webinars. And while we hope that this study and our panel discussion today will inspire you to find ways to serve more climate friendly food, and we are definitely here to help with that. The focus of this report is really to illuminate the policy and the structural changes that are needed to better align school lunch menus with leading public health guidance for healthy eating and climate science. And we hope that today we inspire you to get more involved and to work with us in the coming year as we have new opportunities to influence school food policy with a new administration in place at USDA and the planned upcoming focus on child nutrition legislation in Congress. So I'm happy to now pass this over to Emma, who's going to share more detailed results of the study. Thank you. Thank you, Kari, for that great overview. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Emma Finn. I also work on Friends of the Earth's Climate Friendly School Food Team. In my role, I provide research, analysis, and technical support to school districts in California, especially related to student and community engagement. Now, I'd like to go over some of the key findings from our report. What's on the menu? Here's what we found. As you can see here, the vast majority of school lunch entrees offered in California feature animal protein, while just 4% of entrees were plant-based. And of those animal proteins, 16% of entrees contain processed meat. That's, you know, your pepperoni, hot dogs, deli meats on school menus, um, and processed meats are known carcinogens, according to the World Health Organization, meaning that 16% of entrees contain cancer-causing food. What you're looking at now are the top 10 entrees gleaned from California school menus. Red meat dishes make up four of the 10 most frequently offered entrees with cheeseburgers, beef crumbled dishes, hot dogs, and meat pizzas offered most frequently. The bean and cheese entrees are the only top entree in which any part of the protein requirement is fulfilled by a plant protein. It's also important to point out that three of the most frequently offered menu items, meat pizza, hot dogs, and deli meat sandwiches, contain processed meats, which is clearly out of alignment with the 2020 dietary guidelines and all leading health, public health recommendations. Now, what about the climate impact of these meals? As you can see here, the beef and cheese on school menus dominate climate impact. On California school menus, beef represents only 16% of total menu offerings, yet it accounts for over 60% of the carbon footprint of lunches offered in California's top 25 school districts. Meanwhile, Plant-based proteins, such as beans, tofu, and lentils, make up 4% of the entrees offered, yet represent only 1% of the carbon footprint. Now, many districts provide vegetarian options by using cheese to fulfill the meat, meat alternate requirement. However, these, these cheese dishes are neither low carbon nor particularly healthy, often being high in saturated fats and sodium. Now this next figure compares the relative carbon footprint per serving of the top 10 entrees we saw earlier. Beef entrees by far carry the largest carbon footprint and are also among the most frequently offered menu items. Beef items are typically 15 times more carbon intensive than the bean and cheese entrees. 
Now, in addition to menu research, we actually looked at USDA foods purchasing data in the state of California because USDA foods really drives what is on the menu. For example, in 2014, a study found that 70% of USDA commodity funds nationally were spent on just four types of food, raw beef, mozzarella cheese, cheddar cheese, and chicken. And these four types of food made up 88% of the USDA foods sent for processing into foods like hamburgers, pizza, and chicken nuggets, which all appear frequently on California school food menus. According to 2018-19 data, California school districts spent two thirds of their USDA food dollars, totaling $117 million annually on industrially produced animal products. Only 2% of purchases went to plant-based foods. And beans and nut butter are the only plant-based sources of protein available. What is perhaps even more troubling is the fact that the largest meat and dairy conglomerates have monopolized the USDA foods market. For example, Tyson Foods, the biggest meat and poultry producer in the United States, also recently in the news for exploiting workers during the pandemic, supplies 44% of all poultry purchased in California schools through USDA Foods. In each of these top four protein categories, just three companies dominate 70% of the sales to California schools. Rather than supporting independent, local, or organic producers and keeping these dollars flowing into our local economies, this tax-funded program is locking school districts into supporting corporate-controlled, highly concentrated, polluting animal agriculture entities that are also dangerous and exploitative for workers. That is an issue I think we all would love to change. And with your help, we can do that. We know that school districts function within extremely limited budgets and they're given dollars that can be only used for USDA foods at below market rates, which incentivizes these kinds of purchases and puts many food service directors who are doing the best they can with limited resources in a near impossible situation. The good news is that we can change this and many of you are already making important menu shifts. Many school, many school districts across California are serving plant-based and plant-forward menu options and they're doing it successfully with menu items that students love and that save the district money. If you'll recall, Food Service Director Erin Primer spoke during our second webinar about how her organic Thai basil lentil burger at San Luis Coastal Unified is well loved by both meat eaters and vegetarians alike. Her plant forward meal kits at the start of the pandemic were so popular that they have now become the default option for all meal kits being sent home during COVID-19. This graphic here is showing the most popular plant-based menu options that were served during the month of October, 2019, excluding the highly popular nut or seed butter and jelly sandwiches. Now, we chose to omit those from these graphics because that is all too often the only option for plant-based menu offerings. And it's frequently the Smuckers and Crustables brand of PB&J that's chock full of added sugars, hydrogenated vegetable oils, and other additives that make it less nutritious for students than a scratch-made PB&J, for, for example. In our research, we found that beyond the peanut butter and jelly sandwich, 16 districts served a plant-based option for students at least once a month. Four districts never offer plant-based options. We hope that the information provided through this webinar series will inspire school districts to increase plant-based options on the menu to two to three times a month. In terms of choosing the healthiest plant-based options for students, one of our nonprofit partners, Eat Real, has developed a guidance document for K-12 food service professionals. Through its Eat Real certified program, Eat Real empowers school districts to increase access to high quality real food options. We encourage folks to check out their guide and other available resources at eatreal.org. And last but certainly not least, I wanted to leave you on a positive note with a tangible way to bring change. We call this image the burger swap. This graphic shows that if all school districts in California swapped out one beef burger for one black bean burger just once a month, it would save 220 million pounds of carbon dioxide equivalent. 
the same as taking 22,000 cars off the road for a year, growing 1.7 million tree seedlings for a period of time, or converting 26,000 residential solar systems for a year. And that is just one swap. We hope that school districts will consider at least two to three per month, and we are here to help, so please reach out. And as we encourage you all to make shifts, we know that what is really needed is policy change. And we're really wanting to partner with you all to advocate for the changes needed for you to serve healthier and more sustainable food. Now, we'd like to have a poll to participate in. Um, Bianca, you wanna go ahead and launch that? It's launched. Awesome. So we're asking, are you interested in receiving technical assistance for your school district to support an increase in climate-friendly cuisine? If so, what type of technical assistance are you seeking? Support for increasing plant-based menu options, organic procurement, both. If you'd like to see a different, different type of support, feel free to email us directly with your needs. All right. Next up, Chloe will be highlighting some of the policy recommendations in our report and share the ways in which you all can participate in the policy process. Awesome. Thanks, Emma, and great to be here with you all. Appreciate the opportunity to be part of this webinar and that everyone's taken the time to attend. Um, my role at Friends of the Earth is to pass and enact policies that facilitate your all's ability to serve healthy climate friendly menus, um, to fight against the policies that are barriers to doing that, and to secure the funding that you need to be successful in serving healthy climate friendly options that your kids love. So one of our key findings from this report that Emma and Kari both alluded to already is that school meal policies and incentive structures, including inadequate funding, are a primary driver of K-12 menus that rely heavily on industrially produced animal products and processed foods. So in other words, despite all of the amazing work that school districts are doing, all of the technical assistance and culinary training that we can offer, there's still only so far that you can get toward shifting to truly healthy and climate-friendly menus because of the policies and a lack of funding that stand in the way. Um, next slide. So I wanted to share a few examples of this that come from uh, school food service operators. One anonymous school food dietitian shared with us, I am pulling my hair out every single day because I am trapped in feeding big ag products to children. And I talked about this already that USDA foods in particular is dominated by meat and dairy companies that are bad for the climate, that are bad for workers, yet you're trapped into buying those products. You have to spend your USDA foods allotments and so this person was lamenting the fact that they have to buy food that doesn't comport with the values that their district supports. Another example that isn't on this slide is a school food service operator who shared that they would love to serve morning star veggie patties, but the USDA foods beef patties were only 25 cents compared to 50 cents for morning star veggie patty. Now that pricing is not logical. If you think about it, the ingredients of the morning star veggie patty are the same things that are fed to the cow that then create the beef patty. So the reason that these uh, prices don't reflect the true cost of meat um, to the environment, to workers, to animals, is because again of the policies and the subsidies that are set up mostly at the federal level, but at the state level as well, um, that are pushing school food service operators to buying products um, that aren't aligned with your values and where you'd ideally like to take your menus. Next slide. So we have to change the policies. That's the, that's the conclusion we came to. Uh, next slide. So these are a few examples of some of the policy changes that we've identified based on conversations with school food service operators. I'm gonna skip over the district level ones because you're gonna hear from some panelists who will talk about what they've been able to do in their district. In California, we have an opportunity right now to expand funding for California's Farm to School program and ensure that that funding is permanent. That funding can be crucial in helping school districts serve healthy climate-friendly menus, procuring organic and local options. 
California could also track and reduce greenhouse gas emissions from its USDA foods purchases, and it can provide financial incentives for schools to offer plant-based entrees and organic food options. We have to have these incentives in order to level the playing field between industrial meat and dairy and um, conventionally grown foods and organic foods and plant-based foods. It's not a level playing field and states and the federal government can change that. With USDA, it can expand plant-based protein offerings. It can offer better meat, include a preference for organic produce, and it can improve transparency, disclose comprehensive ingredient lists and sourcing information. And somebody mentioned this in the chat, I think Sally already, that it could update meal pattern requirements to make it easier to serve plant-based proteins. And then in Congress, they can increase meal reimbursement rates, establish universal free meals, make it financially easier for you to be able to offer these options, develop grant programs to help with sourcing, nutrition education, kitchen facilities and staff training, and ensure that the meal standards reflect the updated UGA recommendations. Next slide. So if you take one thing away from my portion of the presentation today, I hope it is that your voice matters. And it's a really cheesy thing to say, but it's true. So I had to do it. Uh, policymakers see school food service operators as the authority on school food, and rightfully so. You know your barriers. You know your kids, your families. You know what works and what doesn't. Um, and policymakers really value that. Next slide. So I just wanted to give a few examples. Some, for some of you, advocacy is old hat. I see some people in the chat are saying they contact USDA all the time about these things. That's awesome. For others, uh, engaging in policy may be newer. So uh, to start off, looking at your own wellness policy, adopting that at your district level, and you're, you'll hear more about that later. Calling your legislators, urging support for farm to school funding. Um, a great way to get started is to invite your elected officials to tour your facility and have school lunch. Give them the experience and get that personal connection with your policymakers. And then you can write USDA asking them if you want lentils for USDA foods and they're not available, write USDA to ask for lentils because that's actually how USDA knows that they have enough demand to, to source lentils and include them through on the USDA foods available list. Next slide. So to kickstart your advocacy uh, or to continue it for those of you who have been at this for a long time, we wanted to share two pre uh, time sensitive advocacy opportunities. One is a coalition letter urging the California legislature to support Governor Newsom's budget request for $10 million for CDFA's farm to school program. And we have a link there. We'll send that in the follow up as well. And then we also have a letter to USDA urging them to better support districts in serving plant-based sources of protein, organic foods, and better meat. And we have a link to that there as well. This one is for school food service operators only at this time. Um, you're free to sign on to the letter via that form or to take the letter, make it into your own, um, and send it to USDA. But either way, we hope that you'll be willing to engage in advocacy with us. And I think that Debbie may have a poll on just that subject. Uh, right now. So if I've done my job, we'll get like 100% saying they're ready to engage in, in advocacy. Thanks, Chloe. And uh, thanks, Chloe, Emma, and Kari. What a great presentation. I'm so excited about this report. This report will be released publicly soon. So those of you who have signed up for this webinar will be getting it in an email when it's a release. This is a preview. So you're all getting information before it's, it's gone public. So I'm so glad you've had a chance to listen today. We do have poll question number two. You've heard ideas that were generated from the Friends of the Earth team from our research, but we really do wanna also hear from you. What federal or state policy change would be the most helpful for you and your team? Please pick two. We're looking at universal free meals, financial incentives for serving plant-based options and organic and regenerative meat from small scale regional producers, more availability of plant-based proteins in the USDA foods program, as well as increased funding for organic in farm to school program. So um, let us know what you're thinking. And before I introduce our incredible panel, uh, I wanna talk a little bit more about what's going on in California where many of you on this uh, webinar today are working. And in California, it's such an exciting time because we're ushering in a new era with farm to school. As many of you know, Governor Newsom last year put $10 million in the budget for farm to school, does an open, requests for applications. I hope many of you are applying. And Governor Newsom also put another 10 million in this year's budget as Chloe mentions, and we're hoping that will become a permanent budget item 
and uh, we're really excited about the possibilities here. And the goal of the grant programs that are being offered through Farm to School is to incentivize and incubate innovative Farm to School pilots. So what we want is for our communities and decision makers to see what's working, see what's possible, see where investments are needed. So this is our chance, California, to make a difference. Let's do this and uh, let's show everybody what we've got going on and have an impact in other states and across the country, which I know we will. So um, we're about to uh, bring in our panel. I have the honor today and hopefully they're all spy spotlighted um, at the top. Uh, we're fortunate to have nutrition director experts with us. We have Alex Emmett, culinary manager of student nutrition services from San Francisco Unified. Thanks Alex for uh, sharing some ideas in the chat already. Francis Gonzalez, Director of Nutrition Services from Ojai Unified. And then we have Jen McNeil, a former lunch lady and founder of Lunch Assist. Thank you everybody for joining us. We're so privileged to have you here to share your information with our audience. So just you know, circling back, you heard the presentation, the menu items that we're discussing today, which are good for our climate and healthy for our kids, are increasing plant-based and plant-forward menu items, increasing organic purchases, and also improving meat quality. So we have the first 10 minutes, I have some pre-planned questions I'm throwing at our panelists. And then the second 10 minutes, we'll be opening up for audience questions. So again, you'll get live answers from experts. Please ask us questions. So um, I'm gonna start with you, Alex, with our first question. So, you know, you've heard a lot about the policy structure today from our, our speakers, but we know you've done a lot already on the ground. And so how have you been able to make changes to improve meat quality, to increase plant-based and plant-forward offerings within the current policy structure? And then what have the impacts been of those um, changes that you've seen? I'll pass it over to you, Alex. Um, okay, thank you so much. Um, well, first of all, this has been a really interesting conversation to, to listen to, and it's prompted a few ideas in me just as I've been sitting here. Um, I think, Personally, I like the less meat, better meat approach. And this has really been the most successful approach that we've used both here in San Francisco and then also in my old district in Oakland Unified. And there are a couple of folks from, from Oakland on this webinar. Um, you know, I think this is really the most accessible way to decrease meat on the menu while still giving students familiar favorites. Um, and then generally, you know, because plant proteins are less expensive, you know, think things like beans or lentils, when paired with meat, you can often afford to serve a much higher quality meat product, things like grass-fed beef or that type of thing. So these are entrees, you know, like beef or turkey and bean chili, tacos, bean and cheese nachos, that kind of thing. Um, and then in San Francisco, you know, we we do have demand for for plant-based meals, and honestly, it it often comes from students who don't regularly participate in the school meal program. And, you know, I think you could make the argument that, you know, is this a chicken or an egg issue since, since, you know, as we saw in the report here, and it's certainly true in San Francisco, we don't really offer that many plant-based options, entree options on a regular basis. We've certainly made some strides in the past few years and, and have some offerings. Um, and, you know, where we've seen a big boost in participation um, is really honestly where we've invested in facilities to increase our capacity for scratch cooking. Um, so this has allowed us to menu some much more interesting and diverse plant-based choices, things like um, bean and rice bowls with guacamole, falafel wraps, um, even a vegan Reuben sandwich. Um, and this has all been made possible really through facilities investment, um, largely thanks to, to bond measures. And of course, thanks to our hard work and dedication of our staff. Um, and I know I think Josh from SF is, is on this webinar today. So. Um, he's pushed forward a lot. His is the, the vegan Reuben sandwich. You can ask him for the recipe. Um, yeah, I, uh, that, that's where I land. I think, I think facilities, facilities is number one. And then I think, um, you know, meeting students where they are and doing a less meat, better, better meat uh, approach has been, has been most impactful. Great. Thanks so much for that. That's a, a lot of, awesome information, a vegan Reuben, I wanna try that. <laughs> and facilities, yeah, we have to be able to have facilities to cook in. Um, all right, I'm gonna pass it over to you, Francis. What uh, things have you already been trying on the ground in your school and your district and what are some of the impacts you've been seeing? Uh, here we have uh, eliminated all individually, individually wrapped 
products that are usually highly processed. Uh, we also stopped using all beef completely and started purchasing minimally processed products. And for the most part, we scratch cook. Um, we have created and started using recipes that we could easily substitute animal protein for with plant-based. Um, black bean enchiladas, bento box, we make hummus here in house. Uh, zucchini fritters, whereas we normally use chicken for chicken parm sandwiches. Um, using chickpea flour and eggs. And then uh, just like shepherd's pie we use kidney beans to where it's also inclusive and then we're not trying to make too many different menu options because it's already targeted towards both. We do have a lot of community, community input and recognition for including the vegetarian community here. Um, and it also gives meat eating families new recipes and insight to what their kids are willing to eat or will eat while also staying on a budget because we do have a lot of the community that relies on the meals here. So it allows them to create new things at home for family, family friendly. That's awesome. Um, that's really helpful to hear and exciting actually all that you are able to do already within the current you know, regulatory system. Jen, I'm gonna switch it over to you. I know you work with a lot of different uh, lunch ladies, as we like to call them, and, and we're a for, former one yourself, but um, what, what can be done and what are some of the impacts you're seeing? Yeah, thanks, Debbie. Um, I love what, um, what Francis and Alex shared. Um, those are some really great insights. Um, when I was a child nutrition director, I got to see firsthand how impactful and transformative some simple switches can be, like changing from pressed and formed meat to whole muscle products or swapping out, like Francis, it sounds like you're doing like those plastic wrapped double dogs that are often on menus to just an organic chicken apple hot dog with a locally baked bun. Through our work at Lunch Assist, we've seen our clients take plant-based recipes to the next level and really push the boundaries of school food. And over time, we've learned a few takeaways from all this work that we try to keep in mind when many plant menu planning. So I have five tips um, just to, to share with you today. Um, number one, serve higher quality proteins. Antibiotic free chicken, grass fed beef, local seafood, those are always well received and a good use of funds for those who have it. I know it's not always supportable for everyone, but if you have us and um, the extra funds, those are really great ways to spend. Beans. We found that beans and lentils do really well in warm, hearty comfort foods like chili, sloppy joes, pastas, and burritos, rather than in cold dishes like salads and wraps. Again, just from our experience, doesn't mean it's a universal rule. Number three, what's up? Or more specifically, what is the meal up against? So thinking about this can be super helpful for budgeting, forecasting, and mitigating risk when introducing new items, especially on menus that only have two or three choices per day. And this can be a way for you to think through what item you're going to, you know, what plant-based or higher quality meat item you're going to put on your menu and how, how much you're going to serve of that. You can play it kind of both ways, depending on what it's up against. <laughs> samples. Everyone loves samples. No. Always taste those items with students before placing on the menu. And this is great for adjusting recipes, soliciting feedback, introducing items to picky eaters, and even just to build excitement and buzz around a new item. Kids will think of things that we've never, you know, we would never imagine as adults. Like when we launched a ceviche style recipe um, using local seafood, homemade salsa and tortilla chips. We sampled it and asked the children for ideas for naming the item and our kids in Encinitas very cleverly called it fish and chips <laughs> because it was fish served with tortilla chips. Um, it was just a fun way to include student feedback on the menu and we, we featured it as San Diego style fish and chips. And then finally, one of my favorite strategies to encourage folks to make plant-based is to make um, plant-based versions of your daily options. And this is an inclusive way to offer plant-based meals that offer familiar flavors. For example, like I saw Michael Jockner, he shared um, from Morgan Hill in the chat. Um, at Morgan Hill, they offer chicken tikka masala, 
and cauliflower tikka masala on the same day. And the kids are more open to trying the cauliflower entree since it's covered in the same familiar and delicious sauce as the chicken entree. This is also a great way to encourage children to go plant-based for the first time. Okay, that was such an amazing list. San Diego style fish and chips, you just made me hungry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, I feel like I could listen to all of you all day. So. We have another uh, planned question, then we'll get to some of the questions from the audience in the chat. I'm seeing some questions come up. So we know that when we design policy, one of the uh, key things you do is really think about what are the barriers to the types of changes you wanna see. So addressing barriers is critical, figuring out how to make sure that we move resources into addressing those barriers. So what, I know we're talking about success stories, but we also wanna hear from you what your barriers are to change what have been your personal experiences? And then what policy solutions do you have? What are your ideas that we could bring with us into Congress, into Sacramento um, to make sure that we're addressing your needs on the ground? I'll start with you um, first, Francis. Uh, the biggest barriers we've had lately has been the limited availability with the USDA being short on everything. Um, but we would definitely love to be able to have more options. Just a wider variety of beans, of legumes, nuts, just plain and simple, as well as cuts for you know the menu items that we do continue to use meat. The processed items, we, do, we have tried our hardest to eliminate all of them, as well as cured meats. Um, that would be the biggest thing, also allowing us to spend commodity dollars locally. Uh, where we are, our community, we have a lot of ranches where we would love to be able to spend dollars on, as well as farms, you know, for the produce. And unfortunately, that's not where it goes. So that would be the biggest thing. And the universal free meals uh, here would highly benefit our district. Great. Uh, and I know ranchers, you know, they want access to these markets. I've, I've heard a lot from them as well. So that's a, a really important recommendation right there. Uh, Alex, I'll, I'll pass it over to you. Sure, thanks. I, I can first say I echo the call for universal meals and I think that now is the time. Um, I, you know, I think we've seen the, just how critical school meals are through the, the pandemic and, you know, a lot of school food operators are the only folks who are we're on the ground right now in schools and, and families really need that access. So that's number one, absolutely. Um, you know, the USDA food program, I think could really use an overhaul broadly. And I'm not sure we have the time to kind of go into everything that I would like to change about it, but um, I'll highlight that we need more transparency uh, for USDA foods. So SFUSD, for example, we don't buy any proteins through the Brown Box program. Um, because ingredient statements aren't available before we place orders. So you can get the ingredient statement after the, the warehouse has received it, but you can't, you can't do it now, like when I'm placing my orders for next year. So that means that I run the risk of buying something that has artificial colors or other ingredients that are prohibited by our wellness policy. Um, and like others have said, I'd love to see more diverse commodity options. Um, and I've specifically been pushing for more organic choices as some other folks on this, this webinar have too, um, especially through DOD. Um, I think that this would be a great way to increase sustainability in the school meal program and get more organics into our kids, onto our kids' plates. Um, you know, I think local policy can also be a great way to push forward change. Uh, I mentioned our wellness policy and our wellness policy has prohibited um, poultry raised with the routine use of antibiotics in our district. Um, so I'd love to see more policies like this on the federal level, especially since supply in this area, you know, has really grown a lot in the last decade. It's a totally different world than it once was. Um, and then finally, you know, as I mentioned before, I think facilities investment is really key. Uh, schools will always rely on heavily processed foods if they don't have proper facilities to cook from scratch. So this is really, you know, one of my number one uh, or one of my top priorities. And I think it's really the biggest barrier that I see uh, to improving the quality of school meals um, and incorporating more plants on our plates. Great, that was a lot of good information um, and very specific. Thanks for those really specific, thoughtful answers. Um, and all right, Jen, 
what would you say are some of the key barriers and what are your recommendations? And we're taking notes on all of this. So this is great. And this will all be recorded so we can share it with policymakers. So let's hear from you. Yeah. First off, I echo everything that Francis and Alex just shared spot on. Um, kind of said it better myself. And I have a little different example to share. Um, so I'm going to tell you a quick little story. There's lots of challenges on the policy front. And the picture I'd like to paint is about how flawed the USDA crediting for plant-based proteins can be. So in your mind, I'd like you to start by thinking about a chicken nugget. Okay, now picture five chicken nuggets. Typically, most schools are buying commercially processed nuggets, not making these items from scratch. In most cases, those five commercially prepared chicken nuggets are going to count as two ounces of meat and one ounce of whole grain. The outer coating on the nuggets, also known as the breading, actually counts as a whole grain. So chicken nuggets credit towards both the meat and the grain component. Okay, so if we follow that logic, then some other plant-based foods should also be able to count as a meat and a grain, right? Unfortunately, this is not the case. Let's take a look at quinoa, for example. Quinoa is a beautiful plant-based food. It is technically a seed that we serve as a grain, but it's super high in protein compared to other grains. One cup of quinoa actually has more protein than a whole egg. A whole egg counts as two ounces of meat meat alternate in the USDA guidance. But what does quinoa count for? One cup of quinoa credits as two ounces of whole grain, but unfortunately it does not count as meat meat alternative at all. If we follow the same logic as the, of the, as the chicken nugget, then little quinoa should really credit as two ounces of grain and I don't know, at least one ounce of protein, but it doesn't. It only counts as a grain. And as such, a school that wants to feature a plant-based recipe with quinoa has to go searching for other proteins, even though the quinoa should really be credited. There are other similar examples littered throughout the USDA food buying guide, which is a major barrier that schools face when trying to implement plant forward menus. The crediting guidance and other related policies really need to be updated in order to align these rules with a sensible, climate-friendly, and health-promoting approach to school food that resonates with our students and makes sense for program operators. Thanks, that's uh, really helpful information. And um, I'm just amazed at, I, I, we needed an overhaul, <laughs> it sounds like. However, we can also start with a you know, few of these great specific ideas to um, the way we out, you know, menu uh, requirements, DOD fresh, a lot of the local ideas. I like that you're mixing it up, you know, the, the federal policy with the, the state policy needs um, and also including uh, things like infrastructure in there. So this is really helpful information. I'm gonna go to some of the questions that have been in our chat. And um, I've noticed from Maureen, several times in the presentation, it's been brought up that plant-based protein meals are less expensive to produce. And other times because of USDA commodities, animal pro protein meals um, are sometimes less expensive to produce because of the subsidies. So can any of you share some actual costs uh, to help illustrate, is that possible right now? Um, I'll just open it up to whoever might have an answer. Um, I know, I know Kari had shared that um, Friends of the Earth has some pretty good analysis of um, the differences between uh, plant-based and meat credited recipes. I know some of it was taken from, from Oakland. So I think Kari had shared that link in the chat and I think that would be a great resource. Um, you know, I can share, we, we, we found a really good price on, on organic grass-fed beef and we're able to pay about $4 a pound which is cheap, but uh, for that type of quality product, but of course, you know, a conventional product is, is much less expensive. So, you know, about an ounce of, of that would only cost 25 cents, but of course I have to serve, you know, about 1.24 ounces or something to credit as a one ounce uh, equivalent. And then a one ounce equivalent uh, portion of, of canned beans is usually running really, really inexpensively, you know, maybe 10 cents or something. So you can see how you can combine those together to get a pretty, affordable entree. And then 
you know, USDA foods are really complicated, right? So if it, there's all these different avenues to use your entitlement, which, you know, anyone who does this knows. So I think what you're referencing is using diverted commodities. So you can send some of your entitlement to companies um, like Tyson, and then I can buy basically a less expensive um, chicken strip or whatever, or you can, you can send it to a, a pizza company and buy a, a less expensive pizza essentially. So, you know, it, it, it varies product to product and, and item to item, but um, generally on those diverted items, you do tend to get a, more of a cost savings with the, the protein uh, foods that you're diverting from, from USDA, because you can also divert things like, you know, flour or whatever, um, but it doesn't usually save you as much money, but, you know, brown box items, it's, you know, free or whatever. It's, it's, you're not having to, to spend uh, money on it. So it's kind of a, a one-to-one, I think, because a lot of times your food budget, a huge piece of it is going towards the protein items, especially when most of those are coming from animal sources. A lot of folks do opt to use their commodity dollars to offset those costs. It's, you know, a budget strategy. The produce actually has gone up in cost quite a lot lately. So I, I do see a lot of districts and ours included where prioritizing um, produce for, for purchasing, your, for using your commodity dollars. So the DOD program that we've talked about, and then also the new unprocessed or relatively new, the pilot program, um, which has a lot more flexibility um, and is one way that we've been able to buy organics for our school meal process, FFBP program. That was a long answer. <laughs> It's helpful. You've got people on the on the who are really excited for this detail. Um, before we go to our last poll, because we want to make sure we get it in there for those of you who are able to engage in um, or willing and ready to engage in policy, because we're really hoping to inspire you to be a brain trust with Friends of the Earth. Um, I'm going to have you. We're going to have the last poll come in. Actually, why don't we do the poll now, and then Francis and Jen, I'll see if you have any responses to that. I want to make sure we. Uh, get as many people involved as possible. Bianca, thank you. So would you like to be informed about opportunities to participate in policy advocacy ideas? Some of the thing, these things are sign-on letters. We might do focus groups. We might do virtual meetings with legislators. There's a lot of ways we can make it as easy as possible. We know how busy you all are. We're not gonna take a lot of your time, but, but we do wanna make sure that your voices are heard. So please let us know and we'll be reaching back out to you if you um, are able to be involved in policy efforts with us. Great, thanks. All right, I'm gonna throw it back to you. Um, Francis and Jen, did you wanna talk specifically about pricing or um, if not, I, I have a couple other questions um, before we wrap up. Yeah, I might just actually point out, like I love what Brendan Shields just shared in the chat about cash and lieu of commodities. That's like a simple policy change that um, would really solve a lot of problems. Um, as Alex mentioned, USDA commodities are really complicated. And I've been in the industry for 11 years and I'm pretty good with understanding a lot of things. And I get super confused about commodities still. It's so complicated. Something like cash in lieu of commodities would free up funds for districts to use locally, like Francis with her local ranchers. But it would also cut through a lot of the unnecessary, really overly complicated things that school nutrition directors have to try to understand, especially folks who are new to the field, when you have so many other complex regulations and personnel and lots of other things that need to be focused on. Um, the commodity program is just like this extra beast that we have to wrangle that is really difficult for a lot of people and has a lot of systemic flaws. Yeah, I think that's a great idea also. And I would 100% agree with you. It might be something we all rally around and focus on because, right, it gives, it puts the money, as you said, into the hands of the people who are spending it on the ground, who, who know how they want to spend it and know how they need to spend it um, best. So um, I see another question. Let's see, Kathleen Reed. Um, I see you're showing popular plant-based options. How do these plant-based options compete with meat-based options in terms of popularity? Um, when they're offered in the schools. So um, anybody, Francis, Alex, or Jen, what do you think in terms of popularity for these plant-based items?
I talked for so long on the last one. Somebody else should take this one. All right, Francis, I'm gonna put you uh, in the spotlight here. <laughs> what do you think in terms of popularity? When it comes to plant-based versus meat, can you unmute? Having a little trouble with the voice. All right, Jen, I'm going to put you on the on the spotlight here. Yeah, again, I think it. I I think it really comes down to like the way things are paired on your menus and like the the um, the recipes that are utilized, right? So, I mean, anyone who's ever been to like a nice vegan cafe knows that like really good plant based food exists. And it's super delicious, way more delicious in many cases than the alternatives. Um, but we have to put the same type of thought and effort into our recipes that we put on the menus. And um, I know, for instance, like when the, the new regulations came out um, and I was planning a school menu back in, I don't know, 2013 and looking at, okay, how do we do beans? And a lot of people, you know, we just put like, chickpeas on the salad bar and like threw them away every day because no one really wants just plain chickpeas but if we roasted them in the oven and made little chickpea salad toppers with a nice seasoning and herbs and spices that was something that the kids really loved and was similar to a crouton and something familiar texture flavor to what they were getting so I think it all comes down to like our recipes and the way we solicit feedback um, and learning more about our students and the cultures that are represented in our schools and how we can make some of these items, familiar items that are inclusive to the, the children that we, and the communities that we serve and represent the flavors that they're used to at home, um, while also introducing some new fun things like Frances was mentioning with her shepherd's pie, you know, that sounds delicious and that can be, you know, recipes like that can really get, build excitement. Um, I also like the idea of having similar items um, that are like plant-based and not plant-based because then it often can like help children kind of make that switch and try something different without it being such an obvious change. Like, oh, I'm just selecting this totally different entree. It may be a little bit easier sometimes for kids to select something that's very familiar to them, but is just like plant-based ingredients, but you know, the same dish type just a little bit different ingredient in there. And it's a little bit lower risk change for them and not so obvious to, to their friends that they're making like a big change. Um, it just, you know, flips it in there and they just kind of take the other option um, and can also be helpful. Like if you run out of one option, it's not something totally different to their favorite food. It's just slightly different. So all these things that we, we kind of think about when we're on the ground and operating in the cafeteria. Right. So marketing is, is really important. And I think, you know, I'm seeing in the chat, like calling, making sure it's chili and just not beef chili or vegetarian chili and, and just the way you market, the way you talk about it. Right. And, and also cultural, make sure, making sure it's culturally appropriate things that kids recognize. Yeah. I think those are all great ideas. I know we're coming to the end of our panel. Um, I did notice, um, Kari, you want to make sure that we ask the panelists what they think about cash in lieu of commodities. It sounds like this could be a, a really interesting topic to continue to talk about um, following this panel. So I think, um, Jen, you mentioned that you, that you thought it was a good idea, but, but uh, everybody, do you, is this something that if, if you were going to be lasering in on, on a topic, a policy advocacy position, is this, what do you think about this? Maybe Alex, start with you. I mean, sure, I love cash in lieu. <laughs> um, you know, I have experience working in district both that did cash in lieu and one that does not. And um, it's so much easier to have cash in lieu. So I, I, I don't know if it's realistic, but I, because um, I think there's a lot of sort of big business that's in the commodity game, like we've all seen. But um, yeah, I mean, also just keep in mind though that that commodities are not the full food budget, right? So it's a small portion of the overall food budget. So I don't think it's the only answer, but I do agree with everyone that it would be a huge help in terms of just um, eliminating some of the crazy uh, hoops that we have to jump through um, to get food on the table um, because this is, it, it's, yeah, it's a really challenging, uh, 
program and really lacks transparency. So yeah, I think it'd be awesome, 100% support. Great, and I know it's 3.30, we're going over just a couple more minutes because it's been such a rich discussion. I hope that's okay for y'all, but Francis, do you have any, any thoughts about that? And, and after that, we'll, we'll be wrapping up. And I, Jen, uh, I think you commented unless I, I was wrong on that. Yes, all right. Uh, for our, our district, it, it would actually be great for us because for the most part, we're using our commodity dollars on DOD produce um, just because the quality of meat isn't really where we want to spend the money from USDA at least. Yeah. So it would be it would be a great option for us, especially with all the local ranchers to be able to obtain better products. Okay, I think we have a great idea. <laughs> um, we have a lot of so many good ideas. All right, well, I wanna thank everybody for being here today. Um, this was such a rich discussion and such you have so much expertise to offer and everybody in our chat also have been watching all the conversation and I, I'm really hoping, I know that um, we, we hope that you'll be inspired to take part in policy. We're excited to lift up your voices and uh, your voices are the ones they're going to listen to our elected officials because you're the ones who really are experiencing this on the ground and you and your communities. So please do engage. I'd also like to just reiterate our, our two calls to action. It's in the um, chat, the links, the farm to school letter. We wanna make sure that that $10 million sticks our goal is to get permanent funding for farm to school in California, um, to, you know, expanded funding. And then also the USDA support letter, which uh, Chloe talked about, and that's also in the chat. And then let us know, because I think that uh, this webinar series has been so popular that it's likely going to uh, be continuing on. So what topics would you like us to cover? What do you wanna talk about? What do you wanna hear about? Because um, you know, we're here for you. So please reach out and let us know. You'll see the email in the slide there um, and reach out and let us know how we can support you. We're offering technical support and um, we're, like I said, just you know, ready to help if we can. So um, thank you so much for joining us. Please listen if you can, please share these resources with your friends and, and uh, stakeholders in your community, the video recordings, the reports, and uh, look out for this school lunch menus report that's about to be released. Um, I'm not gonna give a date yet, but I know it's coming soon. And, um, and thanks everybody for being here. We are so grateful for your time. We know how busy everybody is and so grateful for all your participation. Um, it's been a, a really important conversation. I know I, I actually learned a ton in a really short amount of time. So thanks everybody for being here.